All right, today we're going to talk about treatment of dementia. It's kind of a bleak picture, unfortunately. It's not, there's not a lot of great drugs out there. There's some drugs uh, that you'll focus on, two classes of drugs, actually, and some other than the supplements and stuff we'll get into a little bit, talk about a little bit about diets. Just more FYI, just kind of interesting stuff, but <clears throat> excuse me. Um, not a lot of drugs, again, in this presentation. So just for studying purposes, testing purposes, um, just focus on the drugs for my course. Some of this stuff may help, again, with ICM other courses. I don't know. Um, let's get into it. So just some background for everybody. Alzheimer's disease is a neurodegenerative dis disorder. You'll probably be learning about it and getting a lot of it in pathophysiology, ICM. Um, but it's the most common cause of dementia. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Sorry about that. I've been trying to catch all my coughs because I have all these like funky allergies and stuff. Just trying to catch all my coughs and sneezes for you guys. Sorry about that. Hopefully we didn't have like headphones on or anything. My apologies for that. Um, anyway, so it's basically memory impairment is, is what, but there can be other, um, there's other signs and symptoms out that you'll be learning about in your other courses too. Unfortunately, too, this is kind of like with Parkinson's disease. It's just mainly symptomatic treatment. Um, there isn't disease prevention or disease modification as far as the pharmacological agents go. Um, they're doing a ton of research on this. This is a big a big issue, especially with the baby boomers in the U.S. You know, the U.S. is getting, as a country, we're getting older. Um, and so there's definitely a lot of, lot of research and study going into this. All right, I caught those sneezes, and those were big sneezes. So y'all didn't hear those. Okay, good. All right, so unfortunately, it's just going to be symptomatic treatment here. Um, and with the symptomatic treatment, there's non-pharmacological interventions too that I won't be talking about. And like I said, I, I believe will be t touched upon or discussed in your other courses. First of the two um, big pharmacological agents for Al I'm sorry, dementia is um, cholinesterase inhibitors. So these basically inhibit um, increased cholinergic transmission um, by inhibiting the cholinesterase enzyme. So of those, we have four that are approved by the FDA, Tacrin, Denepazil, Rivastigmine, and Galantamine. You can kind of cross out tac Tacrin from the list. It's um, uh, No one really prescribes it anymore, or they shouldn't be, because it has very hepatotoxic, um, and then it has very severe GI adverse effects. So, um, I mean, it's there. It's still around, technically, but... Um, don't prescribe it. And so you don't, I don't really see it ever being prescribed or anything. Here's a good ta table of the medications that are available and are prescribed here. So you notice Tacrin is not on the list. Um, dose, dosing, just FY for my test. Um, pay attention to the comments here. Really just with the patch, you have to rotate the sites and that there are uh, fewer side effects than a pill. So that can be advantageous um, depending on your patient. Like with Parkinson's too, this is going to be a customized approach, especially when you're picking your cholinesterase inhibitor. Um, you're gonna, it's going to be cost um, if the patient can, you know, which one they prefer, um, if they tolerate one or the other, if they um, they like a patch or they like the pill, or taking a tablet. So, excuse me. So you can kind of choose any of those of this table here as far as what you want to start with. So there's no first line, like, oh, everyone starts with denepazil and, you know, et cetera. Um, really, any of these can be first line. So of the cholinesterase inhibitors, just stay away from the tacrin, basically. So tacrin is not first line. These other ones are um, first line. And then as far as the specific preparation, uh, it's going to be up to the patient. So for studying purposes, you can study it that way. I'm not going to get super crazy detailed and be like, like uh, trying to catch you guys, I'm like, oh, you picked the patch? Well, you should have picked the oral disintegrating tablet. Gotcha. No, I won't do anything like super. Um, oh, you did regular release? I wanted extended release. It's not going to get to that crazy of a level on the exam for my test. <laughs> I can't speak for other people's tests. No, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to, I don't, students in the past thought I was going to play the gotcha game. I don't like playing that game. But so just know these are all first line. I definitely want you to know which ones and which ones are cholinesterase inhibitors and their mechanism of action and, you know, um, and then to not pick tacrin, right, because of hepatotoxicity, ad GI adverse effects. So um, those are the big things I want to make sure you're, you're learning from this, not not to really get you on like patches and versus uh, tablets and stuff like that. So um, for, for this in particular, other, t other drugs, other classes of drugs, I will sometimes 
Uh, we're going to, in the GU module, there are some medications where I will want you to pay attention if it's patch or if it's oral or if it's extended release. And so we'll talk about that later. But for this module, um, don't stress about that. Just make sure you, you, you have it. Um, unfortunately, the, the evidence is kind of mixed as far as if it's beneficial, not all patients benefit. Um, is it really helping or is it not? Um, small improvements, big improvements. Um, so it is something that it's not un unfortunately it's not a great drug, um, but they are they are used, they are prescribed. Um, they can benefit patients, but um, don't be too frustrated if you do prescribe some of these. And excuse me. <coughs> oh. All right, y'all can't see me, but I'm shaking my head. I should have caught that one. I was like my trigger finger there, trying to get that uh, that pause button. Sorry about that. Oh. <laughs> Ah, and there's this stupid little gnat too that I'm like, I'm gonna inhale that little bastard, and it's not. I'm also gonna start coughing when I inhale that little gnat thing <laughs> that's buzzing around. <laughs> okay, sorry. A day in the life of me recording in my living room. Okay, um, where was I? So don't be frustrated if you these medications are not successful. Um, this is just it's it's part of these medications. It's not you. You're not picking the right one, but you can't. That can be part of the reason why too. You kind of have to maybe try another. Um, another form, or I don't know, if, if compliance is an issue, for example. All right, I'm sipping on mint and honey tea. Hopefully you can't hear it and like hear me slurping and stuff. I'm, I think that's helping my throat, but all right, got to get through this. All right, let's keep going. Um, so yeah, that just go ahead and read through this, that you know that there's been some benefits. Um, they also may benefit from amentadine, which is the other big one we're going to talk about when it comes to dementia. Um, and these can be used both as monotherapy, so you can use the cholinesterase inhibitors by themselves, you can use momentadine by itself, but you can also use them in combination, and they actually make some combination um, prep, uh, products, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, but anyways, you just go ahead and read through this. Um, it's just got some, some good, good advice. Speaking of momentadine, so this is an NMDA antagonist as far as mechanism of action, um, just refer to that as far as its classification and its mechanism of action. It is proposed to be neuroprotective, so it is an advantage over the cholinesterase inhi inhibitors. Um, so that is something that, you know, and so usually, n not necessarily reserved, but it's usually used for more severe dementia because of that neuroprotection um, that they thought. And then they also, too, they will still use this even if they don't show improvements with methadine, just because of that neuroprotective um, possibility. So um, it does have modest benefits. Again, it's not a great medication as far as like your patient just sort of bounces back and is like better than ever. But but anyways, and so you can go ahead and read through that as far as what's efficacious for or not. Um, it is advantageous as far as side effects are concerned. So typically less adverse effects than the cholinergic agents. Um, but you still have to be concerned with dizziness it is the most common adverse effect. Other, other than that, some psych adverse effects can be an issue, and those can be problematic too, especially in a geriatric patient. So it's dizziness and then the confusion that increased risk of fall. So I, I, you've heard me say that a number of times throughout the year already by now. Um, hopefully you're not sick of hearing it from me. Um, but that's just fall risk is something you have to be concerned with with an elderly population. And so these medications that can make that worse um, can be problematic. The jury is not out as far as the mentee is concerned. There are some um, some questions that are still being studied, still being looked at. Um, so is it really neuro neuroprotective? Um, what's the long-term benefit? Um, it Once the baby boomers, so once the bigger population is on, is going to be more adverse effects that are going to come out? Because sometimes it's like, oh, it's not really that many adverse effects, but it's if it's not that popular of a medication or it's not prescribed a lot, there's just not a lot of adverse effects because not a lot of people are taking it. So um, that's another concern, too, that once a lot more people end up taking this, will we find out that it's actually you know, worse than we initially thought with the ad concern of adverse effects? So um, so anyways, there have been, you know, there, there is some good evidence that's pointing to, to using it. And like I said, it is still prescribed. Um, and, but as always, you have to look at drug tolerability costs and make the, this, the uh, treatment individualized. I mentioned before, it can be used in combination. They actually make some combination caps, capsules with an epizole and a Um And so 
and it, like I said too, it can still be prescribed even if you don't have any clinical improvement. So signs and symptoms or symptoms aren't getting improved, but because of that neuroprotective proposal and low side effects and usually well tolerated, um, it is a lot of times continued and patients are still on it even if they don't see um, benefits, which I'll tell you from personal experience can be really frustrating for family members or caregivers because they're like, why are they taking this? This stupid thing's not doing anything. Um, so that is an instance where you have to explain to them that it's hopefully, it may not seem like it's doing anything, quote unquote, um, but it is hopefully helping per the disease from progressing and getting worse. So, which is kind of an abstract thing. And it's sort of a, you know, I don't know, it can be frustrating. And, and again, this just caregivers in general with these types of patients can get frustrated easily and stuff, which, you know, it's natural, normal, etc. Antioxidant therapy. So other medications, so like I said, those are the big memetidine and the cholesterol inhibitors. Those are going to be the big ones you want to think about for studying purposes for and prescribing purposes for your patients and for my exam. Um, other than that, antioxidants have gotten a lot of kind of buzz or a lot of, you know, popularity, so to speak, with um, in the media and everything. You hear a lot about antioxidants and being protective. Um, the, the, unfortunately, the research has been kind of mixed. So with vitamin E and then uh, selegiline, which is actually a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, an MAOI, uh, which we'll talk about later in the psych module more in detail. Um, but it's just it's showing that... Um, that, you know, there's kind of mixed results. The vitamin E is preferred over the selegine just because um, the MAOI inhibitors have drug interactions you have to be concerned with. They have pretty messy side effects. They also have food interactions too, so people have to be careful what they eat. Um, they're usually more expensive than the vitamin E. However, on the other hand, with vitamin E, like with the herbal products and over-the-counter supplements in the U.S., unfortunately, or they are not re regulated by the FDA, so you have to be concerned with their um, if it's a good source or if it has what it really says in the label. And like I said before in a previous lecture, refer to the you know USP, NSF, those third-party labs that uh, verify those products. So if a patient is, if you are wanting to prescribe vitamin E, uh, make sure your patients know what to look for as far as the uh, credible supplements. And like I said too, so vitamin E is um, more popular. It does seem like a reasonable intervention, um, and it does seem, and it can be used um, with memetidine. Um, but but anyways, and so <clears throat> um, a lot of times it is prescribed. It's kind of seen as like not really hurt, and it's, you know again mixed. There are some positive studies out there. There's some positive evidence, um, but it's not recommended to prevent. So um, it wouldn't be appropriate to prescribe and say, hey, this is going to prevent your dementia and or your Alzheimer's. Um, it's not, that's kind of a selling, kind of sell false hope, so to speak. Again, based on the evidence of, of the tr trials and stuff they've done. Um, this is just more showing about the MAOI inhib inhibitor. Um, just doing a read through that, but basically take home point is that the um, you have to kind of stay tuned. There needs to be more research done that there haven't been um, enough positive evidence to show that this is recommended for all of your patients. Estrogen replacement, there has been enough evidence to show that you should not. So historically, there was th they thought that this would be beneficial. Now it's definitely not to be th thought to be beneficial. So please do not prescribe this for for dementia, Alzheimer's disease, and it actually has been shown to sh have more harms um, than benefits, so you can actually be harming your patient if you do that, so stay away from that. Anti-inflammatory drugs, again, you'll hear this about in the news, popular culture, etc. cetera. Um, basically, again, to be continued, the jury is still out, so to speak. Um, there just needs to be more evidence, or yeah, more research done. There's not enough evidence, again, to just routinely prescribe these for your patients and then say, hey, this is gonna prevent um, Alzheimer's or dementia, and this is going to treat your Alzheimer's or dementia. Ginkgo biloma, um, this is an interesting supplement. Um, this has, um, unfortunately, some inconsistent and unconvincing evidence of benefit, um, but it is um, it is uh, popular as far as I feel like a lot of patients ask me about it in the pharmacy and stuff. It's just kind of in pop popular culture. Um, but for your patients, um, just go ahead and let them know that it's not recommended. Again, there's not enough strong evidence showing that it is uh, beneficial. And then also it's not regulated by the FDA. Um, so that may be something too that if they are insist on taking it, just again, remind them of getting a quality product that is ver independently verified by a third party lab. Statins, same thing. Um, 
there has been some research or kind of some positive sort of um, evidence maybe showing that these may be beneficial, but again, not established, um, not enough positive evidence. So again, not a reason to prescribe a statin, just purely for, uh, you know, that, oh, these are going to prevent Alzheimer's or the disease, or this is going to prevent uh, dementia. Dietary supplements, so same thing. Go ahead and read through this, but long story short, um, not enough evidence to just recommend this for all of your patients and for everyone to to be on it. Um, but, you know, in some of these things, it's like, well, they're not really going to hurt the patient maybe, but still just as far as evidence-based medicine is concerned, as far as um, practicing um, based on evidence, um, not, not really a, a ton of positive convincing evidence. Uh, vitamin D. Again, to some positive evidence, you will hear this. This is another popular kind of in pop culture news, et cetera, but um, need to do, need more research, need more studies, um, uncertain cl clinical significance keyword there. Um, so that can be something. Um, but definitely, I mean, if they have a vitamin D deficiency and, you know, treat the vitamin D deficiency or the same thing with the vitamins over here, if they have a vitamin deficiency, treat the vitamin deficiency. Um, I'm just specifically talking about you know, someone who doesn't have a vitamin deficiency or, you know, and then they're just, you're, or, and or you're giving this, and you're like, oh, this is going to prevent this from happening. Um, you maybe can't confidently say that to your patients. Um, multivitamins, same thing. Um, same issues we talked about, not regulated um, and inconclusive as far as their evidence is concerned. Diet. So you will hear about diet and lowering the risk of dementia. Um, there have been some claims with the low cholesterol and low fat diets. However, those have had mixed results. So again, read through this, but um, not all positive results there. Fruits and vegetables, um, another one too. So people will advocate uh, vegetarianism, veganism, and saying that it is protective. So I'm definitely, I'm not going to go as far as saying that you have to be a vegetarian or vegan, but I'm definitely going to, I do, get, will get behind, um, you know, eating high fruits and vegetables is beneficial for humans, um, but you can still eat you know, animal products and other stuff too, that's also beneficial for humans. Um, but so those are beneficial, but as far as evidence is showing that high fruit and vegetable diet specifically, um, will then prevent you from getting dementia. That's something that's still kind of, there's some interesting studies out there and they're showing there are some positive effects. And, and like I said, if your patient's really into eating lots of fruits and vegetables, that's great. Don't discourage them and be like, no, you can be cut back. You know, so a, a diet high in fruits and vegetables is, is uh, generally considered a good diet. So, um, so anyway, so there's other benefits too of, of having a high fruit and high vegetable diet. Um, so, and so in the way I like to think about it or with patients who've asked me about it is, you know, it doesn't hurt anything. And then just have meat as like a garnish. Don't eat a ton of meat, you know, and or eat less meat and then just have it kind of on the side or whatever with, with the fruits and vegetables. And unless you want to be strict, strict vegan and then you'll need, um, uh, you will need the vitamin supplementation B12 if you are a strict vegan or if they want to be strict vegan, the patient does. The Mediterranean diet. So this is interesting. There have been some positive results with the Mediterranean diet. The problem with the Mediterranean diet is there's not just one version of this diet. Um, so, and, you know, again, in popular culture, depending on what book you're reading or who you're, what expert you're talking to, or what part of the country you're, you're from, um, the Mediterranean diets may be different. So typically high in fruits and vegetables, again, uh, whole grains, beans, nuts, seeds, olive oil, and then, um, lower meat consumption, you know, little red meat, uh, more fish, poultry, um, uh, lower consumptions of dairy products. Um, so that's kind of a generalization, but I'm, I'm hesitant when I'm saying this, cause again, there's no single uniform, like this is the Mediterranean diet. So for, even people from the Mediterranean, you know, depending on what part of the Mediterranean you're from, will eat different things or whatever. So, um, but it's interesting to read through this. There have been some, uh, some positive results, but not positive enough to be like, okay, everyone just needs to be on this and this is going to prevent dementia and guaranteed. So if your patient comes to you and they're interested in this, again, you don't discourage them from eating more fruits and vegetables, whole grains. This is all good stuff here, right? And if they want to stop eating red meat or eat little uh, amounts of red meat, um, you know, again, don't discourage them from trying to, you know, ha eat, eat a better diet. But, but specifically, if they're like, I'm going to eat this diet and I'm not going to get dementia, you'd be like, uh, wait a minute, there's not that much evidence out there that says that. But, you know, again, it probably overall won't hurt your health if you are eating more fruits and vegetables, eating less meat, eating less dairy, 
um, you know, low to moderate amounts. Again, these are kind of thought as being as like a garnish, something on the side, not the main, you know, not just red meat with, I know that and I'm like committing a, a sin in Texas by saying not, don't have a meal with just red meat and, and like a potato. Um, but yeah, so uh, apologies, please uh, don't send your hate emails to me about how I'm saying <laughs> to not eat a lot of red meat. But yeah, um, yeah, so you just have like a little bit of, of, of meat, red meat, maybe chicken on the side. And then your main thing is the fruits and vegetables and other things. Uh, beans are great too, right? Um, so so anyway, so yeah, read through that. It's pretty interesting stuff. Summer recommendations, go ahead and read through these. Um, I just put these here just kind of hopefully help you guys kind of hit the highlights. Um, but again, for pharmacy, pharmacological interventions, we're concerned with the cholinesterase inhibitors and memetidine. Um, um, memantine, memantine, I'm sorry, memantine, memantine and the cholinesterase inhibitors. So either by themselves or in combination. And then of the cholinesterase inhibitors, tacrin is the one you want to avoid. Other than that, you can kind of pick in any of the cholinesterase inhibitors. They're all equally kind of efficacious. Um, so hopefully that's clear for you guys. Uh, a little more summary recommendations. That's it. Um, read through all that. And as always, email me if anything was confusing, if you have any questions or whatever. Or again, if you want to send me some hate email because I'm saying eat less red meat. <laughs> so some pe people just in general, just heads up, some people get really, really upset with you if you start trying to talk to them about what they can eat and what they can't eat. So, I mean, some of it's religious. So like some religious groups don't eat a certain types of, you know, pork, beef, whatever, um, kosher, non-kosher, whatever. So some of it's religious, so they get really upset. But then it's also... Um, even if it's not, it's just like, it's, you know, food's sacred to a lot of people. So, uh, just heads up with, <laughs> with the diet thing. Uh, yeah. Cause when I worked, I worked in the, the cholesterol clinic and we would talk about lifestyle modifications and man, people want to go to toes with me. They were just not, but anyway, so yeah, email me if you have any questions, no hate email, please. And I'll talk to y'all later.